All right, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Well, as I've been getting into a lot with little short videos that I've been doing live on Facebook, um, Brother, Aunt, Brother Anthony and I have been getting into some stuff and the sermons, the kind of sermons that we've been preaching, the stuff that we've been getting into during Torah Talk Time, our live show, and, and the conversations that we just generally have been getting into about having a more personal relationship with Yah, about really pulling in the reins, uh, buckling down, anchoring ourselves deeply rooted so that no matter what kind of wind or wave comes against us, it, we will not be moved. I can read the Bible and have it memorized and have absolutely no relationship with Yah. I can sit there and quote the Bible to somebody left and right, and you think that if somebody has something memorized, that they understand what it is that they've got book smarts to, so to speak, right? Anybody can read a book and tell you what the book's about, but do you know the character of the book? Do you know who, what the author intended? Do you understand the heart of the author? Well, we have an author that gave us a book that is the greatest book of all. And in the world and in this country, it has been the number one bestseller since it's been in print. But this book doesn't have an ending at the end of chapter 22 of Revelation. That's just the end of what happens when we enter into eternity with him. As far as the book goes, we don't even know what Yah's got planned after that. But what I'm talking about is having a relationship with that author. Having a relationship knowing the heart of what he led Moshe and Joshua and the prophets and everybody all the way down the line to John and what he led them to write pertaining to him, to in time, to everything. To be able to understand, like I talked with a, a new brother that I got to meet this morning who, uh, well, technically, we talked on the phone, but um, got to meet him this morning, talking to him, and what it means to understand the difference when you have a relationship with somebody that you know when an imposter appears. Scripture talks about that there will, that Satan comes as an angel of light. That's a reference that he comes looking like Yah. And if you don't have that relationship with Yah, you're going to get suckered in by this imposter. And so what I want to get into about today's message is this is going to be a message about not only understanding what it is to become more set apart in Yah, but to be even more set apart away from the world and everybody in it, away from so-called believers that are not walking the word of Yah, away from the wheat among the tear that are trying to be dressed up like the wheat. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The tares among the wheat that are trying to dress up like the wheat. And then just understanding that when Satan comes as an angel of light to any of us, that we acknowledge, our, we have such a relationship. Let me put it to you better this way. The men in this congregation, I've known all of you, except for maybe one of you, I've known all of you for years. But do I know you? Now, I could be a person who, who has, you know, come to learn your favorite color, your quirks, the movie you love, the movie you hate, and all this other stuff. And if somebody comes up and says, what is James like? He's, he's, uh, 
he's a computer, he, he, he designs uh, websites and all this other stuff. What's his favorite thing to do? And I can just run it all down if I knew James that way. <coughs> then they asked me, how does James handle this kind of situation? I don't know. Why don't I know? If I have all this knowledge of James, why don't I know? Because I don't have a relationship with him. But see, with James, it's the other way around. I couldn't tell you the dude's favorite color. I can't even title his job right. Because I don't know him that way. I know James on a personal level. If somebody was to come up to me and say, what do you think James would do when it comes to handling this kind of situation in life? That I would be confident in being able to answer. Exactly. I know him on a spiritual, personal level, which is the greatest way to ever know anybody. That's the kind of level that we need to know Yah. We need to know Yah on a personal level. We already know it's all spiritual. We need to know him on an intimate, personal level level so if somebody comes to me and if instead of being all well where is this verse oh this verse is Galatians 3 26 blah, 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 and sit there and quote memorize Bible verses well what does it mean I don't know. or somebody comes to me and says hey what is Yah's will on the Sabbath oh man I know Yah's heart on that one amen that's what we need to have. That's where we need to be with our Yah. Is that relationship. That's the relationship he hungers for. That's the relationship he wants between us. So when something or someone comes along to try to look like him, I'm going to know you ain't right. You are not my Yah. You are a fake. I'm going to know it immediately because of my relationship. And this is what scripture meant when it said that my sheep know my voice. It's not literally, I mean, Anthony and I, or Robert or my mom. Okay, my mom, I've known her all my life. I knew her when I was born at an early age. I know that was, well, that was funny, kind of, yeah. Anyways. My mom could be anywhere in a crowd, and if I speak out loud, she's going to know that's her son. And I would know that's my mom. That's what we have to have between us and our Yah, is that when he speaks, it doesn't matter how much noise is around, you know that's your Yah. You know his voice. Amen? Amen. So with that said, I want to get into this. Where has that hand been? <laughs> where has that hand been? I was going to name it. I don't know where that hand's been. <laughs> but I thought, eh, too long of a title. Um, so what I want to I want to help us come to learn. First of all, this this message has been on me for a good couple weeks or a couple months. And I've been thinking about this, thinking about this, thinking about this and the other day, I came to a decision myself that um, I will never shake hands with anybody ever again unless I know their walk, unless I know them. I will not shake hands with somebody again. And I'm going to show you scripturally why that is. All right. So first of all, we're going to just jump into. Um, so first, we're going to get into this is kind of a dual thing. We're going to get into what scripture talks about when you shake hands with others. The do's, the, the don'ts of it first. Then we're going to get into the aspect of what scripture talks about when Yah blesses the work of your hands. And how those two intertwine with each other. Amen? So, alright, so let's just start at the top. Let's go to Job chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. Babe, will you bring the scriptures up? Job 
Job 17, verses 3 and 4. Now put down a pledge for me with yourself. Who is he who will shake hands with me? For you have hidden their heart from understanding, therefore you will not exalt them. Okay, let me just keep going. Let's go to Proverbs 6, 1 and 2. Proverbs 6, 1 and 2. My son, if you have become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. Now, first of all, let me explain one key word here because this word is in many of the verses I'm going to be getting into, and that's that word surety. That word surety means taking responsibility for the actions of another. Did you hear what I said? A person who takes responsibility for another's performance or undertaking. That's what surety means. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? This culture, many cultures, one of the, one of the cultures that I really, really love, I love Japanese culture. It's probably one of my favorite cultures growing up, especially because of martial arts and everything else. If, if I wasn't a believer of Yah, I would have went to Japan and I would have adopted everything about their culture. I love their culture. And I'm not talking about the religion. I'm just talking about the culture. One thing about Japan is they don't shake hands. When they greet, they bow to each other. They do not touch each other. They do not shake hands. This culture here in this country, the Hebrew culture as well, is very much the same. It is not a culture that shakes hands. At least it wasn't. It, they, would, they would bow before each other. They would even prostrate, 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 prostrate themselves before one another. But they would not shake hands. All right? Prostate? Prostrate. Thank God. <laughs> I hope they weren't prostrating themselves before each other. Sorry about that. <laughs> prostrating themselves before each other. Um, but they did not shake hands. This culture, this country especially, as well as many others, the, 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 the practice of shaking hands and doing all this stuff has become so minimized of being of no effect and has been uh, treated or what's the word I'm looking for to be lightly esteemed that people don't realize how much problems they bring in their life by shaking hands with another and that with the way this was on my spirit the last couple months and then actually finally getting into it and reading the scriptures and studying it I'm like, holy mackerel, I'm not ever shaking hands with anybody again. Unless I know you. Unless I know your walk. If you have a walk with Yah that is a walk with Yah, I will shake your hand. If you don't, we ain't shaking hands. The word surety to, to uh, go back to... Take the responsibility for another's performance or undertaking. So when you walk up and you meet somebody for the first time, they could be a pedophile. They could be a murderer. They could be any a Satanist. I mean, you have no idea who that person is and you just made surety with them. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I hope you're really listening close. Facebook, everybody. Pay co close attention to this thing. We wonder why we have so many problems in our lives. Even when we think that we are really walking in obedience to you. Why do I keep having things in my life? Because I am taking on the responsibility of somebody else's actions. How many times a day do you shake the hand of somebody? How many times a week do you shake hands with somebody? That you don't even know... 
that you don't know their life, you don't know their walk, you don't know who they are, you don't have no clue of the wickedness that is hiding in their closet. Are you listening to me? I gotta get an amen or something. Amen. I, I'm serious. I you guys really gotta listen carefully to what I'm saying. Because this is to me, I'm sorry, but I honestly believe this is one of the most vital reasons why we suffer and go through the things and the sickness and everything else besides just disobeying Yah's word if you know better this is another reason why you have the problems in your life that you have I will I, I will stand on that with all my heart because of what the word says all right so with that said let's let's go on to the next one let's go to Proverbs 17 verse 18. A man devoid of understanding shakes hands in a pledge and becomes surety for his friend. A man devoid of understanding, somebody who lacks understanding. Because if you really understood that a handshake is a pledge, and not to mention the fact that that handshake makes your words contract form like the last scripture I just read. It just put your words into action. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So by lack of understanding, you shake hands with somebody and it becomes surety to, their, to your friend. For his friend. Let's go to the next one. Proverbs 22, 24 through 26. <clears throat> Make no friend with an angry man. How many times have you gotten to a confrontation with somebody and maybe you managed to talk it out and not end up boxing each other and you guys said, well, let's just shake hands and go our separate ways. Uh -huh. Are you listening? Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man do not go. Lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. <clears throat> Do not be one of those who shakes hands <clears throat> in a pledge. One of those who is surety for debts. You have taken on their debt. You have taken on their action. You have taken on their responsibility. How many times have we met with somebody or talked with somebody and we said... I'll do this for you. You promise? Shake on it. That's what the scripture is meaning, that your handshake just sealed the deal as a covenant of your words. Amen? And then, from a biblical aspect, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. From a doctrinal aspect, from an aspect of the word of Yah, you're walking, Yah, and everything to do with Yah. This is what 2 John says. Nine, ver 2 John only has one chapter. Verses 9 through 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Messiah does not have L. He who abides in the doctrine of Messiah has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. This, taking it back to the Greek, is a reference to shake hands with him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. By doing so, you just approved of their action. That's why whenever I've had like Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever come to my door, one, I won't let them in my house. And two, when they reach out to shake my hand, I, I won't do it. I won't shake hands with them. That was what I used to do before I came to the point of understanding even more so of what handshaking really is. Now I won't shake anybody's hand except unless I know that you have a true walk with Yah. That is what this is talking about. And they would get offended. They're like, why won't you shake my hand? I said, because 
you're bringing a doctrine that is not scriptural. You have come here trying to teach a word that is not of the word of Yah. And scripture says, and I will take him right to the verse and tell him, it says, I am not to greet you, or I share in your evil deeds. Exactly. And for those on Facebook didn't hear that, um, it was just said that you're by not shaking their hand, you're not taking on the responsibility of their performance and their deeds. And that's what it all boils down to. This, some people may have the thought that, you know, it's not, a, it's not that big a deal, that maybe that was for then or something. But does Yah change? Is he not the same yesterday, today, and forever? Did he not say that I am Yehovah, your Elohim, and I do not change? So what he is telling us here throughout Scripture, and even in this place of the Brit Hadashah, he is telling us that when you shake the hand of somebody, you have made a pledge... And you have now taken on the responsibility of their performance and their actions. When I go home today, I've got to get on my knees and pray. And I have got to repent and ask you to forgive me for every hand that I have shaken. That was not a hand that belonged to somebody who was a child of the Most High. I, I personally am going to do that for myself. I'm going to ask y'all to forgive me and release me for every pledge that I ever made with somebody inadvertently. Because that, those things are part of the reasons why we still deal with some of the stuff we deal with. We know that there are things connected to people. This is why there are some people you won't allow into your house because whatever's on them, you don't want it coming in your house. Most believers have an understanding of that. But this is talking about shaking hands with somebody, taking on whatever is in them, on them, their performance and everything else, and you just took it upon yourself. Does that make sense? But now I want to talk about what it means when we... What we put our hand to do when we are in absolute obedience to Yehovah. Go with me to Genesis 39, verses 1 through 6. When we walk in complete separation unto Yah... When we do everything we can, and I, and I use this word again, or these words, to fine-tune our walk. And as I, as the, as the, uh, the, the sounding like a, a broken record, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go to be the best that you can be in alignment with Yah in all of His ways, in your relationship with Him, walking in Him, knowing Him, being separated unto Him. How far are you willing to go? Because I'd be willing to bet, if I was a betting man, I would bet a million dollars that by the change of this right here, if you stop shaking hands with people, things are going to change in your life. Things are going to change on negative impacts in your life, just from shaking hands with somebody because you're not taking on their responsibilities anymore. Amen? So Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 6. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Yehovah was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that Yehovah was with him, and that Yehovah, 
Yehovah made all he did to prosper in his hand. Man, the hand is so... It's huge. Because what is it that we do? Everything in our life, our relationships, our marriage, our children, our work, our home, our crops, our whatever the case may be, everything pertains to what we put our hand out to do. Amen? Amen. Everything comes from this right here. Putting that hand out there and what to do. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that Yehovah blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of Yehovah was, in, was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Then he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Are you getting this? Are you seeing what's going on? So first of all, this pagan king, Pharaoh of Egypt, could see the favor. The favor was so great upon Joseph that Pharaoh could see how great this favor this uh, favor was upon Joseph by a God that Pharaoh didn't even acknowledge as his own God or even a God. But he knew that there was great favor on Joseph. He could see it. It stood out so much. So before I continue on with that part, I want to throw this at you. I hear people, oh, I need to get Sabbaths off or... or uh, I need this or that, and my boss just won't blah, blah, blah. You know, I have to wonder, what is missing in your life that's keeping them from seeing the great favor of Yehovah upon you? Because a pagan pharaoh saw it so much so that he handed everything in his kingdom over to Joseph to be authority over that the only person that Joseph answered to was to Pharaoh himself. Other than that, everybody answered to Joseph. What are we missing? Why is Yah not blessing the hand that we extend out to do stuff? What are we doing in our walk? Or what do we have in our life? Or what are we lacking in our walk that is keeping Yah from giving us such favor in our hands. Amen? And so when we look at the rest of this, so it even says that Egypt, that, I'm sorry, that Pharaoh didn't even know all that he had. A king does not, not know what's going on in his kingdom. He does not, not know what he has. But yet Pharaoh was so confident in Joseph because of the favor of Jehovah that he was a smart man. I put Joseph in charge of all the land. It's going to be blessed for me. Pharaoh knew that. He understood that. And so he made Joseph lord over everything under him. And didn't even care to keep track of what was in his house. Except he knew what he had to eat. His, he had the bread to eat and everything else. Because he knew that Joseph's hands were blessed. And all that he put them forward to do. Are you listening to me? Look at Jacob. Look at what Yah did with Jacob when he dealt with the flocks because Laban kept trying to screw him over on everything and steal from him. So he would take the rod and every time they would go under the rod, they would be spotted and everything else. Then he would take it away and they would be something else. And he ended up just taking everything Laban had because Yah blessed everything he put his hand to do, as scripture says. So let's continue on. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy 
Deuteronomy 30, verses 8 through 10. And you will again, listen carefully, and you will again obey the voice of Yehovah and do all his commandments which I command you today. Yehovah your Elohim will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the east increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For Yehovah will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the Torah, and if you turn to Yehovah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, does it get any plainer than that? If you will do all that I command you to do, as a start out verse 8, you will again obey the voice of Yehovah and do all his commandments which I command you today. You do this, I will bless everything from your hand. So if we are lacking in those blessings, if, if we are struggling to survive on a constant basis, if we are constantly ill then we need to find out what in the world we are not doing or we are missing for us to get blessed in the fruit of our body and the work of our hand like Yah promises. Because Yah doesn't say he's going to do something and then not do it. If it's not happening, it's our fault, guaranteed. It is never Yah's fault. There is a difference between when Yah allows you to go through a trial or a tribulation and a difference between when you are steadily struggling year after year, physically, financially, or any other way, and spiritually, when, when nothing seems to be working, when nothing seems to get on a, on a level of stability between you and your relationship with Yah, then it's your fault. Because you're not doing something. Or because you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Man, he makes it so easy. And it always comes down to the same thing. The heart matter. It always comes down to the same thing. How far are you willing to go to honor him? This isn't a 99.9% .9 thing. That one-tenth of a percent can affect magnitudes of your life. And you not receiving blessing, you not being blessed in, your, in what you put your hand to do, your health or whatever the case may be. Yah didn't say, I want part of you. He said in Jeremiah 29, 13, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. When we give him everything without excuse, when we stop trying to cut corners in his word and in his commandments and especially in his Shabbat. When we do the things that he says to do without question, quit trying to say, oh, well, that was for then and not for now. And all of these things, when we quit trying to break down his word to see what we don't have to obey anymore, what we don't have to do anymore, that is not a child who is seeking to honor the Father. That is somebody who's seeing what they can get away with. And that's fine. Yah will let you do it, but don't expect Yah to bless you. Don't expect Yah to bless your hands. Don't expect Yah to give you such favor in the eyes of somebody because they see the blessing and favor on you that they hand everything over to you because they know it's going to be blessed. If a pagan king has got that much sense to recognize and acknowledge that kind of favor, then why doesn't your boss or your spouse or whoever it is in your life that you cannot seem to get on a level with that keeps bucking you because your favor is not seen by Yah because you are not in line with Him. Amen. This is where we got to be. This is how this has to go. What are you allowing what are you doing? Whose hands are you shaking that is messing up that favor? 
Let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn, listen, listen, listen. Do not turn from, from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Again, Yah makes it so simple. He is saying, if you will walk in my Torah, you will prosper wherever you go. End of discussion. So why is it that we are not prospering when so many, I see so many on Facebook, social media and stuff. Oh my gosh, all the time. And I, I'm not talking about once in a while. We need prayer. Sometimes something's happening. We need prayer. Things happen. Okay? But there are some people I see on Facebook. It is every week, every month, every year, every time I turn around. It is the same thing that they are going through. One thing after another, after another, after another. And I see the stuff that they're doing on Facebook. And it's like, well, this is why. I can see why you're having all these problems just based off of the kind of stuff that you post on a regular basis. And I don't even know your life. I don't even know you. But based off of the fruit of your post, I can see why you're always having these problems in your life. When are we going to learn? When are we going to learn? When are we going to handle Yah's Torah as being that I need to walk in obedience to it like I need my next breath to live? Amen? So let me read the other verse. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I ain't talking about asking your congregation for $50 million so you can have a jet. I'm not talking about these fake pastors and, and everything that are making a joke and a mockery out of the word of God. This is not that kind of prosperity. The kind of prosperity is where you are consistently walking in good health. The kind of prosperity is where you're financially stable to take care of your family and even have money to help others. I'm talking about prosperity as being that you have a roof over your head. You have food to eat and clothes to wear and all of these things. And even Yah said, if I take care of the sparrows who do not even sow what they reap, how much more will I take care of those who love me and keep my commandments? It's so easy. And yet we make it so hard because we are stiff-necked and rebellious and will not surrender completely to him. We have excuses for everything. I don't want to give up this. I don't want to give up these friends. I don't want to give up this family time. I don't want to do this or but I, I can't I can't just turn my back on so and so. Like somebody I mentioned a while back who chose their their child's baseball game over keeping Yah's commandment for Shabbat. When they have been keeping Torah for 16 years. I'm not gonna take this away from my son. You should have never gave it to him in the first place. And now you're taking away something even more important than those few months of baseball. That baseball is going to come and go. But what you're stealing from them on the Shabbat is a hundred times worse, a million times worse. Because now they don't think that Shabbat is something that has to be kept. You just destroyed that in them after raising them up that way. Uh, I forgot one. Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 
Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Really listen to what this says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So we're going to break this down a little bit. So first of all, do not unequally yoke yourself with non-believers. Because that's what walking in the counsel of the ungodly is about. Do you understand that? Nor stand in the path of sinners. Let me ask you something. What? How many paths does Scripture describe? Anybody? Two. And what are they? Exactly. The road to destruction and the road to salvation. There's only two paths. And one's really, really big, and one is really, really small. But yet this, this says, nor stand in the path of sinners. For you to stand in the path of sinners means you just took a detour off of a path that you should have been on. Amen? Nor sit in the seat of the scornful, yet again, hanging out with non-believers and even those who speak against Yah. Giving platform to people who will try to convince you that Yeshua is not the Messiah. Giving platform to people who will try to convince you that the writings of Paul are false doctrine. Or that the whole Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, is false doctrine. Or any part of the Torah is false doctrine. That is sitting in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of Yehovah, and his Torah, he meditates day and night. What does it mean to delight? What does the word delight mean? I mean, I, to me personally, I think that word is not even strong enough to describe what this really means. When I married my wife, man, let me, let me put this this way. When I met that woman... She stole my heart so fast that one of my best friends at the time, he straight up got kicked to the curb. He didn't see or hear boo of me for months. And when I came back around to say hi to him, he's like, I don't got nothing to say to you. And he, I'm like, why? What's wrong? He goes, dude, you straight up disappeared and kicked me to the curb for some chick. I said, well, she's the wife. She's going to be my wife for the rest of my life. So, yeah, I sure did. And I had no problem with that. He had a problem with that. That's his problem. I wasn't marrying him, but I married her. When we got married, it was the greatest delight of my life. And there's been no greater day except the day that my children were born. In my life. That's what it is to delight in the Torah of Yah. When we got married to Yehovah or Yeshua, when we got married, His Torah became our covenant contract. It became the thing that we cherish and everything that is written in it. There is no fine print. In the Torah. It is all big bold letters. Without any discrepancy. Of what Yah expects from his bride. Amen. Let's go to the next verse here. Verse 3. He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. That brings forth its fruits in its season. Whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. So we are to be a tree whose fruit continually produces in its season. Now what does it mean is a season? Does that mean we have a time off? No. Because scripture says in season and out of season that we are to be consistent. We go through a season. We go through times where Yah kind of puts our things on hold and get a little more training. We still share things. 
our life is still a witness. How we walk, how we handle everything and stuff like that, it's still a witness. But there are times that, yup, we go through these stages, these levels, from being a baby in the Word to, to becoming more seasoned and more matured spiritually. Because we're learning, we're growing. Yah continually is teaching us every day. It's not like Yah gives us a little bit and says, all right, good luck with that. Run with it. He is constantly refining us, sifting us like wheat. Amen? Amen. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now, I want to remind you of a scripture that says, If the just shall scarcely enter therein, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So we're talking about two different people, the ungodly and the sinner. The sinner is somebody who has nothing. They don't have salvation. They don't know salvation. They, they're just, they're a sinner. They're lost. The ungodly is a reference to those who claim to be godly but deny the power thereof. They are the ones of the seeds that are planted among the rocks and the shallow ground that sprout up quickly and, and the wind comes and takes it away or the birds come and eat it. That is what the ungodly is. That is what it's talking about, that the wind comes and blows it away like chaff because they have no root in their walk or in their godliness that they think they have. They are swayed with the wind. They go with what everybody else says. They bounce around from one belief to another when it comes to the word of Yah because they don't stand firmly in the word of Yah. Amen? Number five, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. I didn't realize it said that in the next verse. So I, the point I was just making, the difference between ungodly and the sinner. You bring somebody who has no belief system and bring them in here and set them down, man, they are going to be so antsy they can't wait to get out that door. We've all seen it with people who have come in to... You know, come check it out. They didn't even make it halfway through the service. And man, they were like a little jumping bean sitting in the seat, man. It's like, you on crack or something? Because <laughs> they could not hold still. And they couldn't wait to get out that front door. The ungodly, we've had people like that here. They're good at coming in pretending. But when it came to that conviction, they didn't come back again. They didn't like it. Last verse. For Yehovah knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So in the last thing I want to read is Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I did. Yeah, I did. Go ahead. All right, let me get to it. All right, so we're adding one here. First Timothy 5, verse 22. First Timothy 5, 22. Oh, right? I totally forgot about this. I totally wanted this verse too. Thank you. Well, tell her thank you. Well, tell her yourself. Mary. Mary, thank you very much. I meant to have this scripture verse in this, and I completely forgot about it. Yes, amen. 1 Timothy 5, 22. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. And for anybody who doesn't know what that word means, do not be in a hurry to lay hands on someone. Nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself Pure. Yes. Exactly. Amen. And that'll go well with this right here to close out with. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. 
Walk prudently when you go to the house of Yehovah and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before Yah. For Yah is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore let your words be few. Theref I'm sorry. For a dream comes through much activity. Excuse me. In other words, when you're into something a lot, you will dream about it. Sometimes people take that dream and think it's something special and then it means something when it just was a dream because you've been doing this a lot for the last few days or a couple of weeks. And a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to Yah, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed, Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of Yah that it was an error. Listen to this. Why should Yah be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words... There is also vanity, but fear Yehovah. So in all of this and through all of this, we see that what we put our hands out to do. Let me rephrase that. Through all of this, we see that we need to understand what is it that you put your hands out to do? Where are your hand, where have your hands been? Who are your hands touching? What are your hands touching? What are you? Who are you shaking hands with? Who are you laying hands with? And I'm even going to say this. Even because it's putting our hands out to do it. Shaking hands, hugging somebody, Laying on of hands, receiving things from people if you don't know what it is, it's time to take it to another level. It's time to fine tune it and separate yourself from the world even more so and from the phony who claim to be godly. Because if somebody truly is of Yah, they too also most likely are not going to be quick to want to shake hands with you anyways when you first meet. And what is it that you're doing that is keeping you from receiving the fullness of everything that Yah wants to give to you and bless you with that he promises if you keep his commandments? So for me, I'm done shaking hands. For me, I'm done touching people unless I know they're, unless I know them. Unless I know that they truly belong to Yehovah. Otherwise, they ain't touching me. Because I am not going to take responsibility for their actions or for their deeds. And I sure don't want to end up having to be responsible for their sins. Amen? Amen. Shabbat Shalom, Facebook.